everyone, and welcome to today's episode. I am really excited to be joined today by Kim Flottam, and we are going to be talking about his newest book, First Time Beekeeping, An Absolute Beginner's Guide to Beekeeping. Welcome to the show today. Well, it's nice to be here. Thank you. I'm really excited about this because bees are definitely one of those things that we tried. I love the idea of keeping bees, but right now our hives are completely empty because our last group died. So I'm always looking for more information on this. And um, it's kind of always in the back of my head, like, oh, maybe we'll try again. So um, one of the first things that I think that um, people need to consider when they're thinking about getting bees is, and this was a huge surprise to me before we got our bees the first time, is that bees need a source of water. Um, It's just not something I ever thought about, you know, like obviously all living things need water, but we're very lucky in that we have a pond on our farm. And so we just put the beehives right next to it so they could get as much as they want, but not everyone has that. So, how exactly um, do you provide water for bees? Well, bees can bees, as you said, bees need water, and and there is a, a dedicated number of forager, foragers out there looking for water. They use it to cool the hive, they use it to dissolve the honey, uh, so they need a constant source of water, and they will find it. You have a pond, you're lucky. But if you have if you have bees and you have neighbors who have an air conditioner in the summer, who have a dog dish outside, who have a swimming pool, they have kids that play with you know water toys. All of those are sources of water for bees, and bees will find every one of them. So what you have to do is you have to train them to a particular water source. If you just put a, a bowl of water out by the beehive, they may or may not find it. What you want to do is you want to um, give that water a little bit of scent so that when they find it, they'll smell the scent, they'll find the water, they'll pick some up, they'll take it back to the hive, and they say, girls, here's what water smells like. This is where you go to get it. And then they won't go to the neighbor's dog dish or swimming pool or, or any of those places. A good product to use to scent water is a product called Honey Bee Healthy, and it's a, it's a combination of several essential oils. And what I do with my bees is I have a, I have a small child swimming pool out by, my, out by my bee yard with some rocks and floating logs and things in it. And I just keep that bottle of Honey Bee Healthy floating in that pool all summer long. And every once in a while when it rains and it fills up, I'll go add a little bit more so that it always smells like honey bee healthy. It's a very pleasant odor. And you just don't, you don't need hardly any in there at all. I can't smell it when I'm walking next to it. That's how light it is. But the bees can smell it. And that'll train them to your swimming pool and keep them away from your neighbors. Wow, that is a really great tip. And that is a really good segue into the next thing I was going to ask you about. And that is that people need to think carefully about where to put their hive and what are the things that they need to uh, take into consideration when deciding where to put their hive? Well, the first thing you have to know is, is it legal to keep bees where you live? And there's a lot of places where it's not. Oh, so, good point. <laughs> you know, check with the local authorities. Um, you know, if there's a bee club in your town or your county, uh, those people will know. And, and that's actually a good thing to do even before you start is find a local bee club, join it and go to the meetings. Uh, that way you'll be introduced to all of the local issues that are going on and uh, be able to meet some of the people that you may end up calling for help later on. So when, when you're looking for a place to put a hive, the things to think about are flight pattern. And when a bee leaves a hive, she's going to take off just like an airplane. Which way is she going to go? Well, you can kind of direct which way she's going to go by putting her facing a field and not and away from your house. Or putting a fence right in front of the front door so when she leaves, she has to go up six feet. And then when she flies, she'll be over your head not aiming her at your neighbors. You don't want to do that. This fence can be a, you know, a regular wooden structure. You can plant hedges. Uh, you can put them next to like the side of a shed, something like that, so that when they leave, they're going into 
airspace that isn't frequented by humans. If you've got kids in the backyard playing baseball or softball or swimming or whatever, you don't want bees and kids getting mixed up together. So you want them to go the other direction. So find a spot in your yard that will allow you to aim your bees away from people, away from your home, away from your neighbors. Uh, and you will solve a lot of problems before you ever get your bees. Okay. That is a lot of really great advice there that um, I think most people would not even think about before they get them because moving a hive is really not the easiest thing. It, you can wind up with lost bees if you try to do that. Well, yes, that is exactly true. Once your bees are established in a location in your yard, if you pick that hive up and move it, say, from the front yard to the backyard, or if you've got a big backyard to the other side of the yard, the bees that are going to leave tomorrow morning are going to fly out and when they know where home is and they're going to come back and where's my home? I don't see it. It isn't here. And what they'll do is they'll just circle around looking for home because they're basically lost. Now they'll probably find it eventually, but you've got a time in there when they, they're not finding it. And again, you don't want lost bees wandering around your yard. If you find out that you have to move your bees, something can come up, a new neighbor moved in, tied their dog up right next to the property line, something like that. You can move a beehive a couple of feet a day or every two days. When they come back, they'll see it. They'll come back to where it was, and, but they'll see where it is now and they won't become lost. But you can't move it, you know, 50 yards away in one day. You got a, a couple, three feet, four feet maybe, but um, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt of being able to find home. You trained them where it was. Now you got to train them where it's going to be. Right. That's a really great tip. One of the things that um, I thought was interesting too, is that you have a section in the book called extreme urban beekeeping. And that is for people who may not even have a backyard and maybe thinking that they can't even have bees. And like, maybe they're listening to this and thinking, oh, well, I'm listening to this because in five years, I'm going to buy a place in the country and I'm going to have bees. But you talk about how people can have bees in the middle of the city, even if they don't have a yard. Yes, uh, it's becoming quite common, actually, to have bees up on your roof. And if the building you're in is, is structured carefully, you may even have them on a balcony if you don't have a balcony right next door to you. But up on the roof, there's a lot of things you have to do different than if you have them in a backyard. You have to worry about heat. If your roof is 20 stories off the ground, you're going to have a lot of trouble with wind. Bees not being able to get back to their home just because of the wind up there. Uh, water certainly becomes uh, an issue. You have to have water up there all of the time. And you probably should have... Um, uh, some sort of uh, way to block the wind from the front of your hive. So if you can put, or you have some structure that's up there, part of the roof, aim your bees so that when they come in, they're not fighting the wind every time, get, getting blown off the landing board or something like that. But yes, you can keep bees in the middle of the city. And there's a lot of people in New York who keep bees. That sounds so cool. Um, I've seen that in a documentary, but it just didn't, um, seem like something that most people would think of. So that's really a great tip. One of the things that, that kind of surprised me, I had not heard this before. Luckily, even though we live in the middle of nowhere, we really do not have a problem with skunks. In 19 years, we've had our dog got sprayed once. And that's far as I know, the only time we've had a skunk issue. So I learned from your book that skunks love bees. I think it goes past love bees. They're a delicacy in their diet. <laughs> and here's how a skunk will operate. Generally, uh, a female skunk with a couple of kits will take them out and she's teaching them how to forage for food, what to, what to forage for and where to look for it. And if there happens to be a beehive in her forage area, how skunks will capture bees is they do this at night. They're not out there during the day when there's a lot of uh, bees on the landing board and flying in and out. They do it at night when nobody's on the landing board. And she will reach up and she'll scratch that landing board. Scratch, 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 scratch. And of course, bees are curious and there are guards in there that are destined to protect those bees in the hive. So a guard will come out 
or two or three, you know, looking for what's making that scratch, 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 scratch noise. And with her other hand, she will slap them. She'll crush them. And then, oh. she, and then she eats them. And if your hive isn't protected, and there are ways, things you can do to stop this, she will sit there all night long. And a skunk family can kill a beehive probably in the course of a month. Wow. Yes. <laughs> Here's what you can do raise that beehive up to the point where she can't scratch that landing board. And that's only a couple of feet off the ground. You should have your beehive on a hive stand of some kind anyway to keep the bottom from getting wet. Uh, if you're in, in much of the South U.S., snakes like the undersides of beehives. So a good hive stand is a couple of cinder blocks and then some you know fence posts or four by fours or something like that. And I'll, I'll just wander here a little bit and tell you a trick about hive stands. You see a lot of hive stands that will hold one hive only. They're up off the ground high enough. But when you take that top box off the hive, you've got to put it way down on the ground. And then you have to lift it way back up on top of that hive. If you make a hive stand that's big enough for three hives and only put two on it, when you take that top box off, you don't have to go way down to the ground. You just have to go to the hive stand. So you save yourself a lot of grief over the course of the season. But you need to get your bees off the ground to get rid of skunks and to watch out for snakes and damp ground. Um, it's just all around a good thing to have. Wow, that is a really great tip. I never would have thought of that. So once people have decided where they're going to put their hive, they buy their hive, um, then do you have some tips on buying bees? Like, is it better to get a package of bees or a nook? And just tell us also what those words mean for people who may not know. Well, there are several ways you can buy bees. You can, if you, if you join that club that's, you know, meeting downtown once a month, you may find a beekeeper there who will sell you a, a complete hive ready to go. So, you know, it's a box or two full of bees, and it's got everything you need to become a beekeeper, and you're a beekeeper right now. You can buy bees in something called a nucleus colony, and that's a small colony. Most colonies have either 10 frames or 8 frames in, inside of them. That's the essentially the furniture inside that the bees live on. And you can buy a small, it's like a starter home or a full-size home. This would be the starter home, and then you take that home and you put it inside into your full-size equipment. The way to start bees with the least amount of help for them is to buy what's called a package of bees. And that's essentially a plastic or screened in wood box that has three pounds of bees in it and a queen. Three pounds of bees is about 20,000 bees. And you will go someplace and get that package. You may have to get it through the mail. If you can go get it, do it because post office people really don't like handling honeybee packages. <laughs> That's understandable. <laughs> so you will go to a, a, some local supplier and pick up your three pound package. And I, when you do that, I suggest that you bring some sort of screen material, unless you've got a pickup and you can put it in the back. But if you have to put it in the back seat of the car, invariably there's a loose bee or two on the outside of that package. <laughs> and having a bee buzzing around you when you're driving 60 miles an hour on, on the freeway is not something that you want to approach. So you'll get this package of bees and you'll bring them home and you'll install them in your equipment. When you start with new equipment, they have no furniture essentially. So they're going to have to build all their own furniture, the honeycomb that's inside a beehive. They're going to have to produce all of that. And that takes food, lots and lots and lots of food, more food than they'll be able to uh, harvest and, and gather and forage for early in the spring when you get this package. So you're going to have to feed them a sugar syrup solution for maybe as much as a month, depending on where you live. The second biggest problem bees have is a continual source of good food. So you want to make sure that that doesn't become a problem with your bees. So you've always got food on that hive and you keep it on that hive until they won't take it three times. And you'll see a variety of ways to feed bees on the market at the bee supply store that you go to. There's a, a bottle you can put in front, there's a bottle you can put on top, and there's a bottle you can put inside a beehive that contains sugar syrup. And I pretty much always suggest that you get the bottle that you put on top 
because you can enclose that in a box and that keeps other bees from co coming over for a free lunch. So uh, let me back up a half a step here, if I may. Before you get these bees and before you buy this equipment, I suggested that you go to your local uh, bee club. Talk to the people there and find out if there's a local bee supply company or if there's not, if you have to do mail order. And if, the, if you have to do mail order, which mail order company do they recommend? There are several out there. They're all good, but they're a little, all a little bit different. And the little bit of difference can be a big problem for you because the parts don't fit. So if you get it from supplier A, and then you wanna get some more and you get it from supplier B, parts may not fit and then you've got a problem. So before you start, take a look at the, the suppliers and then get some advice from somebody who can tell you, here's a good supplier, they're reliable, they're you know moderately inexpensive and you can count on them. Okay, that is really good to know. You have so many practical tips that you can tell you've been doing this for a long time. Um, another thing that I think a lot of beginners um, may be curious about and um, not sure if this, if you're being nice to the bees or what, and that is the idea of like using a smoker when you are working with the bees or you're around the bees. Can you talk a little bit about like the concept behind using a smoker and when you might need it? Everything in a bee's world is smell. All of their communication is smell. And the queen talks to the workers that are taking care of her. The workers talk to each other. Everybody talks to the drones. The drones talk to everybody. The foragers tell the bees inside where to go. The bees inside tell the foragers to get more food because we're running low. Everything is smell, different pheromones. Primarily, what smoke does is it interferes with that smelling sequence that's going on inside and outside the hive. It's like unplugging your phone suddenly you can't talk to anybody. And when you open a hive, or when you're even standing by a hive, but when you open a hive primarily, what happens is that there's a, a group of bees whose sole job is to protect the hive. They're, they're, they're defensive bees, and they're, these bees are uh, at the front door. If there is a leak in your hive someplace, you got a hole in one of the boards, there's gonna be defense, defending bees at that hole and there's defending bees right on the top. And the minute you take that hive cover off, those bees at the top are, start producing something called an alarm pheromone. And that alarm pheromone tells every bee in that hive that wake up people, something's going on here that you need to pay attention to. And if you continue to take that top off, more and more alarm pheromone is gonna be, and then suddenly what that alarm pheromone does is it triggers these defensive bees to begin stinging to protect their home. So the best way to open a hive is very carefully, just barely lift the cover and put a couple of small puffs of smoke in it and then close it again. Let that smoke drift through the hive. And now you are turning off everybody's communication system. Lift it again in a couple more puffs and you're getting more smoke. You don't need much smoke, but you need a little in there. And if you get it in there before you take the top off, nobody's going to know you're there. And that's almost the case. You take that top off and nobody notices. Then when you take the top off and there's an uh, there's a top outside cover and an inner cover, you take the inner cover off and you do that same thing again. You put a couple puffs of smoke under the inner cover. After four no, three or four minutes, you can take the inner cover off and, and almost no defensive bees will bother you. You have, you have shut down the communication system and you are pretty much free to roam and do pretty much whatever you want. Here's what happens though. As that smoke wafts through the hive, it's gonna leave. Some of it's gonna go up, some of it's gonna sink down and pretty soon you hit this critical zone where there's not enough smoke to mask the, def the alarm pheromone. And some of these bees will start producing alarm pheromone again. And what you'll see, it's, this is one of the neatest things you'll see in a beehive, is lots and lots and lots and lots of bees will come up from the frames and they'll be peeking out at you. And you'll look in the gap between frames and there'll be a hundred bees between each frame. And they're, they're just checking you out. What's going on? What's the noise? What's going on? 
Wow. <laughs> you put a couple more puffs of smoke on there and then they, they'll go down. Nothing's going on here. I can't, can't tell anything and they'll go back down, leave you alone. So you don't have to use a lot of smoke. You just have a need to use a little bit of smoke at the right time. Wow, that is really fascinating. How interesting. So it sounds like you've helped a lot of beginning beekeepers through the years. And I always like to ask, what are some of the most common mistakes that you see beginners making? Ah. <laughs> well, for people who haven't watched other beekeepers, it's being gentle and slow. My biggest problem is I'm never gentle enough and I'm slow enough. I'm always in too much of a hurry. I've got to get done because I've got two more hives to look at and I've got to get to work or I've got to get someplace. But gentle and slow, everything you do, like we just talked about smoking a hive, gentle and slow. You know, you don't want to be banging frames. You've got a tool that you use to help pry apart some of the parts of a hive. You do it gentle and slow. And if you're making noise, if you're rocking the hive, if you're slamming the cover, if you're banging frames, the vibrations will set off defensive bees, let alone the noise. So if you think you can do what you need to do in a beehive in 10 minutes, plan on 20. Because gentle and slow, that's probably the best advice I can give to somebody beginning is when you're working your hive, well, you're going to want to have a plan before you ever go out there, what am I, what am I going to be doing when I go out there? What am I, I'm looking for the queen. I'm seeing how much honey there is. I'm seeing how much comb they've built. Uh, I'm seeing if I need to add a box. What, what's your plan when you go out there? Know what you're doing before you leave the house. Then you'll know how to start, what to look for, and how to finish. Uh, if you go out there and just to look, and, and that's perfect, a perfectly acceptable activity is to go out there just to look. And in fact, most beginners probably don't go out and look enough because they don't want to bother the bees. But if you're not looking, you're not finding out what they're doing. If something's going wrong, you can fix it before it gets worse. If you need more room, you can add it before they run out of room, those sorts of things. Have a plan before you go out there and then gentle and slow. I think that's really great advice um, and just and a good observation too, that a lot of beginners don't check the hive often enough. I know that's a problem that we had and you're right because you're thinking like, oh, I don't want to bother them. And, and also just that bees just seem like they should be so self-sufficient. Like they, I, it doesn't seem like they should need us to be keeping an eye on them. It seems like, oh, they know what to do. Um, so that actually leads me into the next question I was going to ask you. And that is how challenging is it to have a chemical free hive or organic hive? About 20 years ago, an invasive pest came to the U S that started uh, invading beehives. And it's not a pest that bees are genetically prepared to defend against. And that pest is, a, it's a mite. It's an external mite that lives on the bees and feeds on both adult bees and baby bees in the cell. And our bees just don't get it. It's like an invasive weed in your cornfield. Uh, it, it doesn't, it isn't susceptible to herbicide. It isn't susceptible to plowing. It just keeps growing and growing and growing. And nothing that you have as a farmer has prepared you to deal with this invasive weed. But it came from Asia. And over there, they've been putting up with it for two thousand million years and they know exactly how to control it because they've learned how to control it they know what's good for it and it has natural enemies in asia where it doesn't have natural enemies in america and that's the problem that we have with the varroa mite the varroa mite has no natural enemies in our country and it has no way to defend itself against this varroa mite and that's where the beekeeper steps in and you are asking, there are just like in any form of agriculture, there are ways to tackle that weed that are very, very toxic, toxic to the weed, toxic to the corn plant, toxic to the soil microorganisms that are living there, all the way to going out and pulling it out by hand, which doesn't hurt anything but the weed that's in the cornfield. And there's a lot of things that are in between there. Basically, what you're looking at is something called integrated pest management. 
And what you want to be able to do is use the least toxic method to get the best control you can. This is all of the things that attack bees, but primarily Varroa mite. A way, a, a very non-toxic way to uh, help control Varroa mite is adding no chemicals to a hive at all. And Varroa mites like drone brood better than they like worker brood because drones are in their cell being babies a few days longer than workers are and that gives the varroa mite a few days more to raise its young. She will enter a cell just before the bees cover it up and then the bee inside begins to spin its cocoon and pupate and in 12 days she will emerge from that cell as a full-fledged adult worker bee. The varroa mite goes in just before they cover her up and she lays eggs in that cell, and those she lays a male egg and a female egg and another female egg and another female egg, and the, the male and the females mate inside that cell, and they feed on that baby bee inside that cell. With drones, she can lay three or four eggs. With workers, she can raise maybe two, maybe. A non-toxic way to control these mites is to wait until all of those drone cells on a particular frame are capped and then remove that frame. And with it, you're removing all of the mites that are in those cells. Now, you can, pr you can produce frames in a hive that are all drones, which is a good way to do this because the bees want all drones. The bees need a male population. And if you give them a place to put drone cells in a hive, they'll use it. They'll just go, hey, we're home. Drones, fill up this frame. And once they're all capped, uh, and uh, you will take that frame out and you will freeze it. You will feed it to your chickens. You will cut the, cut the comb out any way you can, but you will remove all of the mites that are in those cells from the hive. No poison at all goes in there. That gets most of them, but it doesn't get all of them. And the ones that are left are going to cause a problem. So there are other ways to control the mites in a beehive. Probably the next least toxic is something called hop guard, and it's a compound made from hops. And it's it is totally non-toxic uh, to bees, but toxic to mites. But this is the mite, these are the mites that are not in the cells, but are wandering around on bees and they the stuff rubs off on them and it, it kills most of them but not all of them you still got some left so if you're, you're trapping drone brood and you're using hop guard you're still going to have some mites if the mite population gets out of control and there are a lot of ways that you need to learn how to count the mites in your hive you can count the mites in your hive literally um, once you hit a threshold of how many mites per hundred bees then you've got to make a decision of what do I do next? And there are some compounds that are, again, not toxic to bees, but toxic to mites. And these are um, uh, organic acids. Formic acid is, is the least toxic and, and the strongest chemical I will put in a hive. It doesn't hurt bees and it kills mites and it will kill uh, mites that are um, not in the cell, but are, are um, on bees outside of the cells, it just in the in the hive itself, but it doesn't hurt bees and and it doesn't contaminate the wax and it doesn't contaminate the honey that can be in the hive at the same time. After that, you start using pretty hardcore chemicals, things that will contaminate wax, things that will contaminate or harm bees, things that will contaminate honey, and then we're way past what you consider, what you just said about raising bees organically. This has been so interesting. And we've, we've barely touched the surface of what this book includes. I wanted to also say too, it's full of lots of beautiful photos. You have step-by-step um, -step photos showing you how to put bees into the hive when you first bring them home. You've got a really nice section on diseases and pests which might surprise a lot of people who, you know, were like me when, before I ever had bees thinking like, well, they don't get sick. They don't have pests. Like, it's so strange to think that bees have pests, but I've seen photos of like 
the Varroa mites on them. And it, it's really sad. Um, and then your book also has a lot of details on exactly how to harvest the honey and everything. It looks like it's really like the book for somebody to get if they are brand new. And I would say even if, you know, it was really helpful for me, like we had bees for a couple of years and um, it, there was a lot of really good information in there for me as well. So um, let me, if I can just explain a couple of things. One is this book was, was designed for the people who are like you who are thinking about keeping bees, what do I need to know? The, the other, another book that I published some time ago called Backyard Beekeeping is How Do I Do It? And that's got the in detail details on how to do all of the things that you mentioned. This book will tell you what you're going to need to be doing. And, you know, you're getting bees and taking care of them and harvesting honey. So it kind of gives you a feel for all of the tasks involved in having bees, not so much how to do them, but what's involved once you get them. And, and I found out after the backyard beekeeping, the main question I get when I give a talk is, how do I know I wanna keep bees? What do I have to know to know I wanna keep bees? And that's where this book came from. Oh yeah, I can see that. Do you have a website or where can people find you online? I work with um, several people and we do two podcasts. One of them is called Beekeeping Today Podcast and you can find that on any of the podcast platforms. And it's done with a friend, Jeff Ott, and he and I interview bee researchers, bee scientists, commercial beekeepers, honey packers, uh, anybody in the industry that is affecting what we do. And then we have another one with a, a friend named Jim Too. And when I was editor of Bee Culture Magazine, he was one of my writers for 33 years. And our, our, the podcast we do is Honey Bee Obscura. That's everything honeybee. And for these are short, 10 to 15 minutes. The other ones are closer to 45, but these are short. And for 10 or 15 minutes, we'll pick some random topic about bees or beekeeping and think of it as sitting down at a at a meeting over lunch and having two people talk that's what we're doing we're just talking bees that sounds awesome well thank you so much this has been a lot of fun and i'm sure a lot of people will find it helpful well i hope so um and if you if you've got further questions you can go to our podcast page and there's a place there where you can ask more questions so Either one of them has that place. And thank you for the invitation. This has been fun. You're welcome. And good luck with your book.